The SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on April 21, carrying 53 Starlink satellites into orbit. The mission, dubbed Starlink Group 414, was SpaceX's 42nd launch dedicated to deploying satellites for the Starlink network. About two and a half minutes after liftoff, the Falcon 9's first stage engines shut down and the booster separated from the second stage. The second stage's single Merlin engine ignited to propel the 53 Starlink payloads into a preliminary parking orbit, while the booster descended back into the Earth's atmosphere for a safe landing on a SpaceX drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. It was the 12th landing for this particular booster, tying a SpaceX reuse record set just last month on a different Starlink launch. The 53 satellites were deployed into their parking orbit as planned about an hour and 20 minutes after liftoff. The satellites will raise their orbits first to a roughly 350 km circular orbit for checkouts and orbital phasing for a few weeks. Then, the satellites will be raised to the operational 540 km altitude once they have passed testing. These satellites are headed for the fourth shell of the Starlink constellation, bringing the total number of satellites launched to 2,388. Of those, 238 satellites have already re-entered, and only 1,685 satellites are currently in their operational orbit. SpaceX signed its first deal with an air carrier to provide in-flight wireless internet using the Starlink satellite network. The service will be available later this year to customers of JSX, a charter airline company that plans to equip 100 planes with Starlink-provided in-flight Wi-Fi. JSX currently has 77 30-seat Embraer jets in its fleet. The company did not disclose the financial terms of its agreement with SpaceX, but it did guarantee that Starlink services on JSX flights would be free of charge to passengers. SpaceX has already applied to the U.S. Federal Communications Commission for regulatory approval to operate Starlink on aircraft and shipping vessels, and they are currently testing Starlink terminals explicitly designed for the aviation market. Dave Tremper, Director of Electronic Warfare for the Office of the Secretary of Defense, recently confirmed that SpaceX successfully defended its Starlink satellite broadband internet service against Russian hacking and jamming attacks. You know, it was eye-watering to see the news report that the Russians were trying to jam Starlink and that the next, almost the next day, I think it in fact was the next day, Starlink had slung a, a line of code and, and had fixed it, right? And, and suddenly that was not effective anymore. Since February, SpaceX has sent more than 5,000 Starlink terminals to Ukraine, giving the country an edge as it battles Russian troops. Russia responded by attempting to jam the signal to prevent Ukrainians from accessing the Internet. However, Starlink engineers and programmers responded quickly to the cyber attacks and were able to thwart them. Tremper stated that the U.S. had a significant timeline to make those types of corrections and added that Starlink is an interesting case study from which the Pentagon could learn how they quickly address the problem. And so there's a, there's a really interesting case study to look at um, the agility that Starlink had in their ability to address that problem and, and, and inevitably what was the impact if they couldn't address the problem. The Large Hadron Collider, located near Geneva, is perhaps best known for its role in confirming the existence of the subatomic Higgs boson in 2012. If we combine the ZZ and Gamma Gamma, this is what we get. They, they line up extremely well, and in the region of 125 GeV, uh, they combine to give us a, an ex, a combined significance of five standard deviations. Consisting of a ring 27 kilometers in circumference, the machine is made of superconducting magnets chilled to 271.3 degrees Celsius, which is colder than outer space. The machine, located around 100 meters underground in a circular tunnel, works by smashing tiny particles together, allowing scientists to observe them and see what's inside. Since its shutdown in 2018, the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator has undergone more than three years of maintenance, consolidation, and upgrade works before restarting. During the test on Friday, April 22, two beams of protons circulated in opposite directions around a 27-kilometer wide collider ring at their injection energy of 450 gigaelectron volts. LHC experts will work around the clock in the coming months to gradually recommission the machine and safely ramp up the energy and intensity of the beams before delivering collisions to the experiments at a record energy of 13.6 trillion electron volts. 
The unprecedented number of collisions planned over the next four years will enable international teams of physicists at CERN and around the world to study the Higgs boson and other subatomic particles in great detail. The forthcoming LHC experiments may also provide more direct clues about dark matter, an invisible substance that accounts for 27% of the universe. After collecting eight rock core samples from its first science campaign and completing a record-breaking dash across Mars, NASA's Perseverance rover has arrived at the doorstep of Jezero Crater's ancient river delta. The journey, which began on 14 March, is a five-kilometer journey around the Ceta region to reach the river delta within Jezero Crater. The delta, a massive collection of rocks and sediment at the western edge of Jezero Crater, formed at the convergence of a Martian river and a crater lake billions of years ago. The site promises to be a veritable geologic feast and one of the best locations on Mars to look for signs of past microscopic life. Perseverance's data suggests that the delta deposits are about 40 meters above the crater floor and it will serve as the staging area for the rover's second science expedition, the Delta Front Campaign. The rover will spend roughly six months picking up eight samples during this maneuvering campaign. The plan then calls for Perseverance to go on top of the delta again, to spend six more months on a Delta Top campaign, perhaps taking the backup option to sample a region untraveled before. Meanwhile, the Ingenuity helicopter is continuing to add to its flight log. It recently performed its 26th flight on the one-year anniversary of its first flight on Mars. The 26th sortie took place on April 19, and the 1.8 kg Mars helicopter traveled 360 meters in 159 seconds, at a velocity of 3.8 meters per second. Space firm Astrobotic revealed the flight model of its robotic Peregrine lunar lander, designed to deliver various science instruments and payloads to the surface of the Moon. As opposed to earlier test models, the flight model is the version of Peregrine that will fly to the Moon later this year, on a United Launch Alliance Vulcan Centaur rocket. The lunar lander is being built at Astrobotic's headquarters in Pittsburgh. The spacecraft is still under construction, with solar panels, two fuel tanks, payload decks, and engines yet to be installed. Peregrine is the first lander in NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services initiative to unveil its flight model and could become the first American spacecraft to land on the moon since the Apollo program. According to Astrobotic, the lander has a payload delivery capacity of 70 to 90 kilograms and 192 hours of surface operation duration. The lander will carry 24 payloads to the lunar surface, including 11 scientific instruments from NASA, a rover called IRIS from Carnegie Mellon University, cargo from several other companies, and cultural messages from individuals around Earth. The landing location of the spacecraft is a region called Lacus Mortis, meaning Lake of Death. Once it lands, the Peregrine will attempt to last an entire lunar day, about 14 days, before the extra-cold two-week-long lunar night kicks in. Peregrine is also a pathfinder for the Griffin lander that Astrobotic is building to deliver NASA's Viper rover to the moon's south pole in late 2023. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. After completing two cryo-proof tests, one on the orbital launch mount and the other on a structural test stand, SpaceX's upgraded 33-engine Super Heavy prototype, Booster 7, has returned to the high bay for engine and grid fin installations. While the prototype appears to be in good shape after ground tests, a newly leaked photograph shows significant damage inside the booster. The image depicts damage to the methane downcomer, which could have resulted from excessive pressure created inside the liquid oxygen tank during the recent cryo-proof test. For those who are unfamiliar, a methane downcomer is a stainless steel pipe that feeds the liquid methane to the booster's 33 Raptor engines through the liquid oxygen tank. Till now, there has been no official explanation from SpaceX or Elon Musk regarding the damage. The image's original source, though clearly a SpaceX employee, is unknown. The image spread through a few Discord channels before making its way to Twitter. The methane downcomer is typically installed in the booster's oxygen tank before stacking and welding the methane tank section over it. Because the propellant tanks of Booster 7 and the methane downcomer have already been permanently welded together, it is nearly impossible for SpaceX to replace the downcomer with a new one. So, I think SpaceX will either try to repair the damage, or they may decide to retire Booster 7 and proceed to the next prototype, Booster 8, for the company's orbital attempt. However, let's not forget the fact that Starship is still in its early stages of development, and the damage to Booster 7 will undoubtedly improve future prototypes. 
The estimated completion date for the environmental assessment of the Starbase launch site to ensure safe spaceflight operations is approaching, but current indications suggest that the environmental review is likely to be delayed again. For example, the Endangered Species Act consultation was supposed to end on April 22, however, no checkmark indicating completion of this review process is visible on the FAA website as of April 23. Since June 2021, the FAA has been working on the programmatic environmental assessment of Starbase, and the final report has already been delayed several times. Given the current trend, it is not surprising if the target date is pushed back again. But let us hope for the best. Moreover, even if the final report is delayed for a month, it will have little effect on Starship's orbital flight test, because the launch vehicle will not be ready for that milestone until June at the earliest. During the 2022 Starship presentation, Elon Musk has said that he might have to move Starship launch operations to Florida and continue with research and development at Boca Chica if there are any further delays in getting environmental clearance. Since the chances of Elon Musk moving Starship launches to Florida have increased, Texas Governor Greg Abbott recently announced that he is planning to fight for SpaceX federal approval to launch Starship from Boca Chica. Obviously, just doing R&D at Boca Chica will not please economic development leaders in the Rio Grande Valley. They view the potential of rockets being launched from Boca Chica as a tremendous boost for the region's tourism and economy. According to Brownsville Mayor Trey Mendez, SpaceX is now the largest private employer in Brownsville, with more than 1,600 employees. SpaceX invested $430 million on operations last year in Cameron County, and this year, the company is projecting to add $885 million in gross economic output for Cameron County, as well as continued job growth. Moreover, SpaceX has leased 46,000 square feet at the Brownsville Aerospace Industrial Park and invested $500,000 to renovate and upgrade the facility. So in all terms, leaders of South Texas want SpaceX to continue its operations at Boca Chica to ensure the region's economic development. Now, let's move on to the updates from Starbase. The Starship thrust simulator with hydraulic rams to simulate the thrust generated by the Starship's inner three Raptor engines, and three hydraulic rams to simulate the thrust generated by the Starship's outer three vacuum-optimized Raptor engines has recently arrived at the launch site. SpaceX appears to be preparing to carry out structural stress tests on Starship 24, similar to how they did on Booster 7. Ship 24, on the other hand, has not yet been fully assembled. Before any ground tests could begin, the propellant tank and nose cone sections must be joined, and aft flaps and thermal protection tiles must be fully installed. Booster 8's oxygen tank section is currently standing outside the high bay, awaiting the arrival of a four-ring stainless steel section in the aft dome. Raptor version 2 engines are being delivered to Starbase for installation on Starship Super Heavy prototypes that are being built at the construction site. After a few months of foundation work, SpaceX has begun assembling the first section of a massive new Starship manufacturing building, known as the Star Factory, which will eventually replace a series of tents at the construction site. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.